Can I just welcome everyone? For those who don't know me, I'm Claire Fox and I'm the director of the Academy of Ideas. Um, and it really is a great privilege to chair tonight's debate because this issue of assisted dying, I think, is one that has troubled many people in trying to work out where they stand, both in terms of um, morally, where they stand in terms of their own principles, whether they're humane to oppose it, um, because that means that you're very pro-human humanist and you're, you're, you care about people's lives, or whether in fact you're more humane to support a change in the law because you don't want to see people suffering. And so, you know, it really is something which I know my friends and colleagues are torn about. And there's a lot of media coverage, uh, much more than I thought there would be. There's been uh, lots of um, discussion amongst parliamentarians about what to do. And we just thought just a couple of days in from the actual vote that it would be an opportunity for people to have their say, ask questions, raise any things that they're troubled about. We're obviously linking this to the Labour MP Kim Ledbetter's terminally ill adults end of life bill um, that will be discussed and voted on on Friday. And I think the title of the bill is important because it does say terminally ill adults um, end of life bill. And so a lot of people have pointed out that that should be a counter to any scaremongering that it might affect children. It was a slippery slope towards anybody who's not terminally ill and so on. But that will be discussed by um, our panellists. Um, actually, it's an interesting situation here because the public discussion has gone through a wide range of iterations at the beginning of this process. I really genuinely thought it was going to sail through and I was concerned there wasn't enough debate. Um, you know, Keir Starmer quoting um, National Treasure Esther Ranson and saying he promised that he'd do something felt like, oh, you know, I genuinely thought that's it. Um, anybody who's got qualms is going to be swamped, but it's not quite gone that way. <laughs> it's also the case that public opinion was very much in support of a change in the law but it's also the case now that that public opinion seems to be shifting. At the very least, I'm, I'm, all I'm arguing at this point is that it's people realise it's more complicated. It's not, you know, good on one side, bad on the other. And sometimes it's hard to figure it out because I've heard so many different legal opinions about how it might work, how it might not work, that I'm now bamboozled and I'm not sure myself that I can fully untangle all of that. I think that moral conscience is very important, but it's also the case that moral conscience can take you in either direction. So this evening, I've asked a group of people, four panellists, broadly two on one side, two on the other, although I don't want to be overly binary about it, to talk about um, what's at stake here. And it's important this, it's not just about, it's not about the technicalities of the bill, Although before we started, Sonia, I think, rightly pointed out that there are people who support assisted dying morally, but are worried about this bill. So that's something that's part of the discussion. But I haven't asked the panellists to do anything other than just give us their reflections. And the format is this, that they're all given about eight minutes each um, uh, to give their opening remarks. Then I'm going straight out to the audience and I'm going to take groups of three or four people to make their comments, ask questions. The Academy of Ideas is very much associated with public discussion, conversation. And it's this is about a more informed conversation, we hope, that you can then take away from this Zoom chat and, you know, uh, carry on with your family and friends and, and colleagues in the next few days. I'll keep coming back to the panel the whole time. A couple of notes. I want to urge everyone to listen to each other's arguments. Um, sometimes we think we know what the other side thinks, and I would urge people to be cautious about that. I'd really like us to try and grapple with the other side of the argument rather than our own. I'd ask people not to try and shame, uh, caricature or attack people they disagree with. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid sounding like I'm doing a tone policing thing, but I just want people to engage in the argument rather than set up straw, straw men. I do think that this is too important an issue to be left to 
kind of parliamentarians or lawyers or judges. Um, and therefore, I think public discussion on this, the richer it can be, the better. Let me introduce the panellists. And I'd just like to also point out that I've tried to choose people who don't fit stereotypes um, in terms of where you might think they might be uh, in this debate. So we're going to, uh, first we'll be hearing from James Esses, who's a writer, commentator, an advocate of freedom and an advocate of women's rights, um, uh, rather heroically, as we said. He's the co-founder of Thoughtful Therapists, and in fact, he was, recording is now in progress, we're told. I hate technology. Right, um, uh, James was cancelled for his gender critical views. Look at he's uh, now become, in the way that sometimes happens, more famous than he ever would have been if they hadn't gone for him. Uh, he runs a substat he, uh, with Matt Goodwin. He's often on the opposite side to Labour, uh, arguing, and therefore, in some ways, although this isn't a Labour bill, I was a bit surprised to discover that James was on this side of the argument arguing for assisted dying. And that's why I thought it would be interesting uh, to have him speak. James is also a barrister, so he does, un or he does, or a lawyer, and therefore does understand the law. Um, we're then going to hear from Sonia Soda, who's the chief leader writer at The Observer, a Labour supporter, uh, I think I can safely say, uh, somebody who's been very enthusiastic about Labour over the years. I think that Sonia is one of our most important and thoughtful political commentators. Um, if I can just uh, be a bit fangirly at this point. She's been raising problems with the bill and raising, I think, all the kind of challenging questions that we need to consider. And uh, Sonia, if I can just say to you, you've changed the mind of several people I know on this very issue because they've read your columns I think that if they thought it was left up to me that, you know, they were like, oh, don't trust Claire, she's a bit loony. Uh, Sonia Soda, however, is not like that. And you've really made them think. Um, Sonia um, is so busy as a commentator that she has to leave early to go and do the Sky, Sky paper review. But we're going to take as much of her time as possible and I'll give her a final word before she goes. Next up is uh, uh, Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Romain. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because... Jonathan is the chair of Dignity in Dying, uh, um, uh, the UK's leading campaign for a change in the law on assisted dying. He's the head of the rabbinic cause of Great Britain. And sometimes people say, oh, the only people who are opposing this bill are all religious. Well, here we try to mix it up by having somebody who's such a highly esteemed uh, rabbi who's going to argue the opposite of where maybe you think that you might place someone. And then finally, we've got Professor Kevin Yule. Uh, Kevin is going to be arguing against assisted suicide, and he is a passionate atheist and humanist, and he's the author of Assisted Suicide, The Liberal Humanist Case Against Legalisation. Um, it's interesting as well that Kevin uh, has spoken many times at the uh, Battle of Ideas Festival that we run, actually as a historian, spoken about American politics, about the civil rights movement historically in the US, um, and even in defence of, wait for it, the Second Amendment, which is, in case people don't know, the pro-gun amendment, not really, but you right to uh, carry arms. I know I'm caricaturing you, Kevin. The point I'm making is, it's hard to know where to place him, but in this instance, he's not the usual suspect in terms of being opposed to assisted dying. So, delighted to have you all, and I'm going to ask uh, James to kick us off with his introductory remarks, please. Thank you, Claire. Look, as some listening will know, the issues I usually debate are ones that I believe to be a fight between good on one side and evil on the other. But this is not one of those issues. Because in the years that I've spent reading, reflecting, researching, and over the last few months as the national debate has heated up, I've only ever witnessed good intent and good faith on both sides of the argument. Death unifies us all, and I genuinely believe that those on both sides are driven by a desire to alleviate human suffering. We already sanctioned suicide. We did this with the passage of the Suicide Act back in 1961, which decriminalised it altogether. Prior to this, anyone who attempted suicide and survived could be prosecuted and imprisoned, 
while the families of those who died could also be prosecuted. However, the government created a new offence of encouraging or assisting the suicide of another. This means that in this country, it is illegal to assist someone to do an act that in and of itself is legal. This is a bizarre thing from a legal standpoint, and I believe the only example of such a thing in our law. So, if someone terminally ill or indeed healthy wishes to die and take a fatal overdose, hang themselves from a light fixture, tape a bag over their head to self-suffocate, handcuff themselves to something immovable and swallow the key, or throw themselves from a multi-storey car park. This is legal, no matter the pain and suffering for themselves and their families. Death, yes. Dignity, no. And by the way, these are all case studies of actions sadly taken by terminally ill individuals in this country. But in fact, we go a step further. Not only have we legally sanctioned suicide, but we've created provision for people to end their lives, even if actions by medical professionals could save them. Under the Mental Capacity Act 2005, people can put in writing an advance refusal of various forms of life-saving treatment should the time ever come. For those dependent upon artificial ventilation to stay alive, they can choose to remove the ventilator. This is what Noel Conway, suffering from motor neuron disease, did in 2021. He died by suffocation while family members looked on. For those who choose to go down this route, it can take hours, sometimes even days, to die. Breathlessness, anxiety, respiratory secretions, and a death rattle caused by mucus in the lungs. Death, yes. Dignity, no. For those who are bedbound and physically unable to kill themselves in one of the lawful and proactive manners detailed earlier because of their condition, they can choose to starve or dehydrate themselves to death by voluntarily refusing to eat or drink. This is what happened to Tony Nicholson in 2012. Tony suffered from locked-in syndrome after having a stroke. He could only move his eyes and he described life as a living nightmare. Dying in this manner can take days, sometimes even weeks. For the person themselves and their family watching on, they can expect delirium, weakness, extreme hunger and thirst, moaning, rattling and severe breathing difficulties. As hospitals or hospices must continue to offer food and water to patients, they must constantly be teased with life-sustaining provision and then forced to reject it every single time, like some sort of pantomime. Death, yes. Dignity, no. And the individuals I've named spent their final years campaigning for a change in the law, but unfortunately died before any such change could take place. Huge, unimaginable suffering by both the dying individuals and their loved ones, and yet all completely lawful. Compare and contrast that with the story of Mavis Eccleston from 2019. Mavis, a woman in her 80s, helped her husband, terminally ill with bowel cancer, at his request to end his life through an overdose. She was arrested and charged and spent the next 18 months in the grips of the criminal justice system before being acquitted. Her children watched on as their father was dead and their mother was facing essentially life imprisonment. Mavis is not alone. Between 2009 and 2024, just un under 200 cases of assisting suicide have been referred to the CPS by the police. Only four have been successfully prosecuted, with the vast majority being dropped, withdrawn or resulting in an acquittal. This is in part because of CPS guidance, which controversially uses the term victim to describe the person wanting to end their life, even though many of them would say it is the state keeping them as perpetual victims by not allowing them the dignified end that they seek. Yet the uncertainty that exists as to whether loved ones may face prosecution means that many choose to fight on until the bitter end, even if it means dying without dignity. Uncontrollably vomiting black bile. Fecal matter pouring out of the mouth. Fungating wounds from breast cancer that is broken through the skin. All real life examples of the types of suffering experienced by those with terminal illnesses in the UK in their final days on this earth. 
Well, so all of this means is that in this country, for those who are terminally ill, they are allowed to kill themselves, but only through suffering and indignity. But for those who want to take prescribed medication to enable them to die as comfortably and peacefully as possible with their family by their side, such a thing is illegal. And that is why the law needs to change. So what are some of the main arguments against a change in law? Number one, that we should focus our attention and resources on providing better palliative care, psychotherapeutic support, etc. Well, firstly, these things aren't mutually exclusive. Secondly, this argument views these people as suicidal and seeks to address it as we do any other form of suicidality. I don't agree. Dying people are not suicidal. They don't want to die, but they do not have the choice to live either. There is a world of difference between someone who wants to die because a voice in their head tells them to kill themselves, an irrational delusion, and someone already dying who wants to die with dignity, a rational desire. If you successfully treat someone for a mental health condition, they will stop wanting to die. However, for someone already dying, they will never stop wanting to die with dignity. Number two, that hospitals wanting to free up beds and family members wanting inheritance will apply pressure on people to choose this route. Firstly, the proposed law creates a new offence around coercion, dishonesty or pressure. Secondly, I am a natural cynic, but this takes an extraordinarily pessimistic view of human nature. Those who go into medicine do so because they want to help alleviate human suffering. And when it comes to relatives, we know so often it is the desperate family members pushing for more diagnostics, more treatment options, more second opinions, anything to keep their loved ones alive. Number three, that there are insufficient safeguards. I do not agree. Strict immovable eligibility criteria. No obligation on medical practitioners to partake. Two declarations with independent witnesses. Two medical assessments, including an independent practitioner. Mandatory lengthy periods of reflection. A mandated high court declaration. Self-administration of the medication. And continuous monitoring by chief medical officers. This is robust. And finally, that this is euthanasia. This is not euthanasia, whereby some individual or state institution makes a decision as to the worth of another's life. This is assisted dying for people who are already dying. Back in 2011, the then Lord Chief Justice said, the problems of assisted suicide should be decided by Parliament, which should be reflective of the conscience of the nation. Well, the time to enact this collective conscience is now. Polling shows the vast majority of the public support a change in law, and now even a majority of doctors support it too. Those who are terminally ill should not be forced to endure a torturous end. They should be able to die in comfort and peace before illness ravages their mind and body. The irony is that by giving these people death, it frees them to live. Instead of constant preoccupation and anxiety over their demise, or indeed making a premature journey to Dignitas while they're fit to travel, they can spend their final few months on this earth amongst family and friends, safe in the knowledge they will die with dignity. I'd like to finish with a quote by philosopher Leonard Peikoff. Suicide is justified when man's life, owing to circumstances outside of a person's control, is no longer possible. An example might be a person with a painful terminal illness or a prisoner in a concentration camp who sees no chance of escape. In cases such as these, suicide is not necessarily a philosophic rejection of life or reality. On the contrary, it may very well be the tragic reaffirmation. Self-destruction in such contexts may amount to the tortured cry, man's life means so much to me that I will not settle for anything less. I will not accept a living death as a substitute. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. I, 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 that deserves a round of applause, even though you can't get it. Um, very uh, moving, very compelling, very persuasive, but not necessarily very right. I mean, that's the whole point. So that's why we're going to hear a counter argument. Um, thank you so much. That was uh, a great way to start, if depressing. Sonia. Great. Thank you so much, Claire. And thank you for being so kind about me at the start as well. I was blushing. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm chief leader writer and economist at The Observer. Uh, and I write for a left liberal, liberal newspaper. And if somebody had asked me how I felt about assisted dying 10 years ago, I'd have you know, said quite simply, yeah, 
I'm in favour of it. You know, I'm a good left liberal. That is a position I should take. I since changed my mind. And the reason for that is really because of some of the subjects that I write about as a journalist. I write a lot about child safeguarding. I write a lot about domestic abuse and coercive control. And it's writing about those subjects that really sort of started off my concerns and I first wrote about you know my concerns about assisted dying a couple of years ago so well well before this is really kind of um, a, a matter of the national debate as it is now so I just kind of want to run you through my concerns and why I've changed my mind about it I'm not ideologically opposed to the principle I think if we could if I knew we could do it safely and that everybody who was opting for it genuinely genuinely wanted it um, I wouldn't really have a problem with it but my issue is I don't think I don't think we can do it safely, although I'm willing to be convinced. I think it's for proponents to convince me. And I certainly don't think that the bill um, uh, that has been proposed is safe. So the reasons why I'm worried about it, and it touches on uh, some of the things that James has talked about. So first of all, um, coercion and coercive control sounds like an incredibly technical term. But really what it's talking about is toxic relationships that are unfortunately all too common in society where you've got one person who's very dominant basically kind of bullying through a pattern of behavior over time somebody else into feeling terrible about themselves undermining their self-esteem and doing things that they wouldn't ordinarily do and you see that in domestic abuse which i've written a lot about but it's also an issue in intrafamilial relationships when for example you sometimes got an older parent and you hear that i mean loads of us will know about these situations for example where you've got you know two adult children and there's a big disagreement at actually around an older parent's care. And one adult child might think that actually the other adult child is not behaving appropriately towards that parent. We know from the World Health Organization that one in six older people suffer from some form of abuse, whether it's emotional or financial. We know in society more widely, one in three female suicides is thought to be linked to coercive control and abuse. And when it, it's very hard to detect coercion and coercive control and abuse, we know often that victims of it don't know that they're that don't understand that it may, may not understand that it's what they're experiencing at the moment. I've spoken to lots of women who've, who've been in that position. And um, it's very, very difficult to detect even after a crime has happened. So, for example, uh, domestic abuse charities think there are, you know, there's well over 100 deaths of women a year that are recorded as accidental or natural, where they, may, they, they were probably killed by their partners. But the system, the criminal justice system, just isn't any good at detecting that. And I know from journalists who work on these issues, on these hidden homicides, how much painstaking journalism it takes to uncover when someone is already dead, if there was coercive control before they died, or you know, if they were sort of, you know, if they were killed or murdered, it can be very, very um, difficult. So, um, and, and the criminal offence of coercion, I'm afraid, I've talked to criminal lawyers. That's just a paper safeguard. Coercion is very, very difficult to investigate by the police, and it's very, very difficult to prosecute. And the idea that you're gonna that in cases where there was there was coercion, that you're gonna commonly get prosecution, I'm afraid that's just not what the criminal lawyers that I've spoken to um, think. I also think there's an issue around internal pressure and whether people feel it's something they ought to do, even if they don't want to do it because it's something made possible by society. And you can see, you know, it might be a pressure that someone puts on themselves. You know, they've, they've got this illness, they don't have that long left to live and they require expensive care to live on. And, you know, that might involve, for example, their children having to give up jobs to care for them. It might involve, you know, an inheritance being spent on um, care. And you can see people opting for a medically assisted suicide in that in that circumstance. I'm also worried about people with mental health conditions. If you speak to palliative care consultants, it's common. It's common response to terminal diagnosis to feel depression. Um, but quite often those symptoms will alleviate over time as people adjust to their condition. Um, and I think depression, if you talk to psychiatrists, it's subjective. How do we know if someone's got, how do we know if someone's depressed? How do we know if somebody is opting for this because they're depressed? And if it is because they're depressed and it's subjective and we don't really know, where do we draw the line as a society between suicide prevention on the one hand a medically assisted suicide on the other. I think that's a really, really difficult um, conversation and challenge for us as a society. I'm also really concerned about the gendered aspects, both of pressure and internal pressure and coercion and undue influence and pressure. And I just don't think that the safe, maybe there are some safeguards that could better 
detect or look out for coercion, but doctors are not trained in, in, in spotting coercive control. Um, I've spoken to doctors, they're like, you know, how are we supposed to do this? Um, that's not going to work. And um, the reason why so, so many retired judges have spoken out about their concerns about the bill is this is just asking judges to essentially be a rubber stamp. We know even in the family courts, I've written a lot about the family courts, where there are allegations of domestic abuse and coercive control, when judges have investigatory fact-finding powers, when they've got agencies like CAFCAS involved and they've got social workers reporting to them, even then we know judges get it wrong. And we know that because there are appeal judgments from the High Court that show that first instance judges get this wrong. And judges do get it wrong. And that's why retired judges are so concerned about this. You know, it's a rubber stamping exercise, but even if they had investigatory powers, how do we know they're gonna figure out when people are under coercion? You know, if you've written about coercive control and the difficulties in detecting it and uncovering it, you understand that when you're starting to talk about the state assisting people to die, it's really, really concerning for the, those of us who know a lot about safeguarding and domestic abuse. Just um, a couple more things I want to say. One is on the slippery slope. So people say, well, there's no slippery slope because it has to come back to Parliament and MPs will decide. So these are very tight, restrictive criteria. I think there are really big questions about whether we can keep something tightly defined. First of all, terminal, terminal illness with six months to live. That is, it doesn't sound subjective if you don't know much about, um, a, 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 about medicine. But it is. Again, if you speak to palliative care specialists, they say that life expectancy beyond a few days is just a guesstimate. So it's really going to be about whether doctors sort of, you know, like whether you've got six months to live, 12 months to live. It's very, very hard to be accurate. So that leads to subjectivity as well. And it will depend a lot on the doctor you go to. And I think there'll be some doctors that get known for um, for signing this off. Um, terminal illness. Again, there's no fixed definition of that in the US in three states. There have been 60 instances. It's probably um, a real underestimate because the data, the monitoring data is so poor there. But 60 instances of when people, mostly women, young women with anorexia have been helped to die. Um, and anorexics um, that I know who work on this issue are horrified by that because they say actually in medicine there are some doctors who give up far too easily on people with anorexia and they say as survivors of anorexia they would have absolutely picked a medically assisted suicide in the moment their bodies were possessed by this disease um, and yet you know in Oregon it's a matter of policy not law it's just doctors saying we define this condition as terminal and in some cases it's been defined as severe malnutrition there's not even any reference to anorexia so i think that's really concerning and then on the palliative care point we know 300 um, people a day are dying without access to the palliative care they need yes it doesn't need to be an either or in theory but it is in practice because we aren't investing the resources that we need in palliative care and proponents of this bill haven't secured um, a, 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 a commitment from Rachel Rees that palliative care is going to get the funding it needs. I think we should all be trying to get that commitment for her. But that's going to put doctors in a position where they have to say to people, we can't get you a hospice place. We can't do what you need in terms of end of life suffering, but we can offer you a prescription for lethal drugs so you can take your own life. I just think that that's really, really dark and we need to think very carefully about going there before we've ensured that we've got the palliative and social care systems that ensure that people won't feel that they have to take their own lives because the care that they want is not available. And I think it is a mass. I've written a lot about social care. It's a massive problem. We don't have the care we need. Ultimately, there are so many experts that I respect. There are retired judges, the former chief coroner, there are seasoned cases, including those who've represented appeals to the Supreme Court to try and get assisted dying le legalised. There are psychiatrists, there are palliative care doctors. They're often people who are not ideologically opposed to assisted dying like me, but they just don't see how this bill can work and the proposals on the table can work. And when you've got experts at that level who are really, really worried about it, you've got to say, why are MPs considering voting this bill through? Why hasn't a different process been taken? There's such huge outstanding questions about this bill. James mentioned monitoring. Monitoring is really key because if you don't, if you think that you, you've got to have safeguards, you've got to monitor if those safeguards work. I can tell you, safe, this monitoring systems in places like Oregon, even the most basic data is missing and there's no details of that monitoring in the bill. It's just chief medical officers going to do it, nothing. 
There's no way I as an MP could vote for a bill unless I know exactly how some of these things are going to work. And what you really need is something like a royal commission of experts who can look into these questions, who can investigate whether it can be done safely. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, but at least say there are these risks and put some kind of figure on the risk. So at least we know as a society, are they risks that we can tolerate? How many potential state sanctioned wrongful deaths are we willing to tolerate in order to alleviate the suffering of some others? And I think there are people who make very powerful cases for assisted dying, but this is a balance and we've got to be very clear about that. And one of the things that concerns me a Finally. lot about this debate is, is the language. So I'm worried about actually this is a conversation that is making us more scared of death. I've had very comforting conversations with palliative care specialists that don't go along the, the lines of what James has been saying, actually, in terms of suffering at the end of life. Yes, there are some conditions where there, there is suffering and that is terrible. But most people with great palliative care could have a much, much better experience of death. And actually, I think that some of these stories we're telling ourselves make it more difficult for us to have that conversation. So I really, as a skeptic, but somebody who's not ideologically opposed, I think the debate has been very, very poorly handled. I think there've been so many people who've been saying, there are no risks. We don't need to worry about these safeguards. I'm sorry, but the number of experts who are concerned says we should be worried. And if you're genuinely interested in engaging with skeptics like me, people who are worried, pushing through a private member's bill where there are so many questions, so many unanswered questions is, is just not the right way to do it. You're not bringing along the skeptics. So that's my appeal to the proponents. You've got to have a different process around this. We need a Royal Commission. Thank you so much, Sonia. I mean, and very useful, I think, to hear from somebody who's changed their position, which I think is an important point in general about you these big kind of conversations that people are open to changing their position and very well explained why. OK, so I'm going to go over to Jonathan now, please, for your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. And hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, now, as Claire said in her introduction, uh, there is an assumption that uh, faith groups are opposed to assisted dying. And it's true that there are many religious leaders who are against, uh, but they reflect a religious view uh, not the religious view. And in fact, there are many people of faith up and down the country who are in favour. In fact, we learnt this year that actually religious opponents are in the minority. Uh, latest polling shows that across all faiths, 66% of people of faith are in favour, not 50-50, 66%. Um, and with some remarkable individual breakdowns, Church of England, 76% Church of England people. We're talking about people who go to church, not nominal believers, people who go to church. Well, gosh, tell that to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, the next one, at least. Catholics, 65% of churchgoers are in favour. Well, gosh, again, tell that to the Cardinal. And, and why is the leadership, the religious leadership, so out of touch with its membership? And I can tell you that um, uh, those figures don't just show uh, that uh, it's the laity by themselves, but actually it's the religious uh, um, leaders as well, priests, vicars, rabbis, imams, uh, all in favour. And we support, we the 66% uh, people of faith, support the right of people to have an assisted death if they qualify it, uh, in other words, terminally ill, mentally competent, and requiring it of their own free will, precisely because of our faith, not despite it. It's because we're religious that we hold that people should not suffer uh, if they can avoid it. And um, uh, you've just heard from James so many ghastly cases which are not unique. That's the problem. If they were, we could dismiss them as one-off here and a one-off there. But I'm sure most people here have experienced it in family or friends. It's because we're religious that we believe that if people are suffering and we have the means to help, then we should do so. And it's because we're religious that we say, yes, life is sacred. But, and that's, a, that's an easy phrase. But what does that actually mean? Well, I would say life is sacred means taking life seriously, uh, living your life to its full potential, uh, as well as respecting the rights of other people to live their life to its full potential. But it doesn't mean to say that life has to aim, end painfully. It doesn't mean to say that your final few weeks have to be a travesty of everything you lived before up to that point. And it's because we're religious that we assert that just as one has a good a right to have as good a life as possible, we should also have as good a death as possible. There's nothing sacred about suffering. There's nothing holy about agony. 
And here's where I think that the religious voices against assisted dying are actually stuck in a sort of a theological cul-de-sac because they call um, assisted dying suicide and say it's banned in religious teaching. But they ignore a massive distinction, which actually James hinted at uh, earlier, because suicide is when a person takes their life for a variety of reasons, uh, ranging from, uh, I don't know, being depressed uh, to uh, it being a political statement. But the common factor in all of these instances is that had they not taken their life, they would otherwise have lived on for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Whereas assisted dying is when someone is dying anyway. So we're not shortening their life, but shortening their death. And assisted dying for the terminally ill is therefore a category very different from suicide. It's a new issue for society at large. And I think religious opponents are making a mistake of using sort of ancient texts for a modern phenomenon, applying centuries old decisions to 20th first century scenarios. And frankly, it's daft, just daft to quote Moses or St. Paul or Muhammad or, or any of them uh, for something that none of them ever imagined. Now, to be honest here, I originally made the same mistake. And as a trainee rabbi, I assumed that assisted dying was uh, irreligious for all the typical Nija reactions until I became a congregational minister. And when I went around hospices and hospitals, as we do, and just saw too many congregants dying in pain who wanted to let go of life, but were not allowed to do so. And I heard, and I'm sure you have heard, people saying, doctor, isn't there anything you can do to help me? Or asking their relatives, can't you put a pillow over my head? And of course, putting doctors and relatives in appalling position, uh, not just legally, uh, but emotionally as well. And then at this point, I uh, came when I saw William Colin. He was in hospice, and I have to say, wonderful care, and I am fully in support of palliative care, and it should go hand in hand. Um, Colin was in his bed. No, I correct myself. He was actually on his bed, but kneeling on his bed with his head between his knees on his bed. And I did say in the nicest possible way, <laughs> why are you doing that, Colin? Why are you in that strange position? And he sort of looked at me and he said, it's the only way I can control the pain. And that was my tipping point, because I just thought there has to be a better way. It has to be a better option. And then I sort of went into the issue and I discovered places such as Oregon. Oregon, which um, is has a, almost exactly the same system as we've got here, although actually Kim Ledbetter's bill is more severe and has added things such as uh, um, a 14 year prison sentence for attempted coercion. And, and Oregon has been using the same system as we have done for 25 years. Actually, it's more now, 27. In other words, we've got a quarter of a century's worth of experience. Over 25 years of regulation, monitoring, medical research, and it works, and it works well. And, and the numbers haven't shot up. There's been no avalanche. Um, it's increased slightly from 0.6% to 0.9% of all deaths. That's a minimal increase. And since then, I found out that actually there's no other jurisdiction in the world where that has had assisted dying, albeit in different uh, types, where they reversed it. Never has anything been reversed. Now, why is that? I mean, it does say something about it being working in different areas and being regarded by the MPs or whatever um, as, as secure and safe. I'll also mention one other person called Doris a person of deep Christian faith, um, but who I visited because I sort of tend to, when, if I'm in a ward, I'll visit people of all faith. Um, and uh, I visit her in hospice. And she said to me, every night I pray to God that I won't wake up. And every morning I'm disappointed. And the problem is that Although there are worries about the future, yes, okay, I get that. There's a real, real problem right here and now. It's not as if we're living in a good situation. It's a bad situation because people have only got three options and they're all pretty terrible. One is if you're suffering terribly, then you just carry on suffering terribly. The other is you try and uh, take your own life, which is often botched, which leaves people off in the worst position. Or if it's successful, it's horrible for the relatives to pick up the pieces, sometimes quite literally. Or if you're wealthy and privileged, then you can go off to Switzerland, um, um, uh, and have an assisted do it, a suicide at, um, at uh, assisted dying at Dignitas, but you have to be wealthy. And also you have to take your life early and you would have done because you have to be fit enough to go on the plane. Um, so it's, we have a real problem in the here and now 
what are we going to do about this real problem in the here and now? And palliative care is a solution, but not the entire solution, because actually we've just had a parliamentary a select committee um, which has gone on for 18 months, so really deep research with medics and palliative care, with lawyers, etc. almost the same as the Royal Commission, to be honest with you. So we've had this 18 months, and it uh, concluded in, I think it was March or April. And one of the things that they said was palliative care is great, but cannot help everyone. It was palliative care experts themselves uh, who, who said that. Now, if the bill does pass, and of course, just remember that the, this is only the second reading. So in other words, if it passes, it won't actually go through. It will just be subject to further discussion. And frankly, if anyone has got doubts or an open mind or reservations, they should vote for the bill precisely so it can have that extra scrutiny. Um, uh, and if it uh, goes ahead, well, End of assisted dying will not be chosen by everyone. I mean, why should it be? And many of us will hold on to our very last breath. Uh, that's great. And people should have every support. But for the Collins on his bed, on his knees, and the Doris praying not to wake up, who do want it, it's religiously right to give them that option. And I hope MPs will allow that to happen uh, precisely so that any concerns that people who are unsure or opponents will uh, then have a chance to address them. By the way, it's actually too late for Colin and Doris because they're both gone now and we've failed them. We've actually failed them and we failed all the people that James uh, just uh, mentioned so graphically. Um, but we can help. Final sentence, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, the future Collins and Dorises who just want to die in peace, maybe at home, maybe with their priest, their rabbi, their humanitarian celebrant around them. And who knows, it may actually be you and me, who, if we're in a ghastly situation, want to have that option. So for me, the two key words, and I'll end with this, the two key words are options and compassion. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, very, again, very convincing and combined. God, I, you know, I've gone from, and said a lot of things I thought were very admirable, Sonia, I agreed with her. Now Jonathan said things that also make me think. Um, so we've got our final uh, comments now from Kevin. Can I just say to the audience, if you want to start putting your hands up, um, if you want to speak or start thinking about whether you want to speak or what you'd like to say, if you go to the React button at the bottom, and uh, forgive me if you're so uh, seasoned and you don't need that, um, and just put the hand up sign um, uh, at the bottom of your screen. But anyway, um, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Over to Kevin. Thank you very much. Now, if you have, um, if you've been through Westminster Tube recently, you may have seen some posters. There are some posters of a young woman in pajamas dancing. These are dignity and dying posters. And I went through and, and they're creating quite a stir, not, not necessarily a positive one either. Um, I would suggest that the real face of assisted dying and perhaps um, the poster face for dignity in dying, who has paid for these posters, very expensive posters to be put up all over the place, is Cyril Twos. Cyril Twos, Cyril Twos is an 86-year-old bruised face, it should really be up on these posters. Cyril Tews was uh, uh, 86 years old, as I say. Um, he was a carer who retired at age 82. He was recently, in January, told he was terminally ill. Um, actually, it's slightly before then, but in January he was told he qualified for the biggest aid package so he could live at home um, for the remainder of his life. And then he was told it would be 10 months before he got that. Cyril Tews chose, uh, and I use that term advisedly, an assisted death because he couldn't get the care that he needed. He could not afford private care uh, with paying the rent at the same time. This is the, these are the people, the Cyril Tews of this world, that are going to actually be the reality of assisted dying, not the young woman, very attractive young woman, uh, dancing uh, on the uh, poster in the tube. So I just want to say it make two points. First of all, I want to make points about the bill. This discussion on the 29th is about the bill. It's not about the principle of assisted suicide. And I must admit, I uh, have long opposed assisted suicide, assisted dying, call it what you will. 
Um, but this bill, I think, is worse than than I think people who support it in principle are increasingly coming and saying, I cannot support that bill. So if we're looking at very specifics, well, for instance, Sam Coates from Sky News said, there's no impact assessment until and unless the legislation passes second reading, MPs will be engaging in one of their most totemic votes of this parliament without access to all the facts. I'm being asked to commit on what is in effect uh, partial information. The MPs had 16 days to read the 38 page uh, bill and to go through it and, and look at all of the various different problems. I saw that I've read it, uh, not all MPs that I've spoken to have. Um, MPs have a lot of uh, pressure on their time. Um, but uh, the specifics that I thought were disturbing, first of all, it doesn't prevent doctors from proposing assisted suicide to their patients. I think that's really problematic. And that has led to some of the awful stories in Canada, like the 53-year-old uh, woman who was just about to have a radical mastectomy for breast cancer and was suddenly made aware of the fact that she could have assisted suicide or euthanasia as it usually is in Canada. So uh, as she said, she was at her absolutely lowest ebb and people do listen to their doctors in this situation. So, and not only that, but if I was a doctor, perhaps I'd bring it up too because all good doctors put forward treatment options and that has to be, uh, you know, this if this bill is passed, that will be one of them. It does not allow conscientious objection I don't know why it's been taken out in the 67 Act. It's been uh, taken, it, it was there in the Maris bill that was attempted to pass for, a, which was an assisted dying bill in 2016. It was in there, but they've removed it. So as a doctor, you have to make what's called an effective referral, which means you can't opt out. You must either um, do the act yourself, become the coordinating doctor yourself, or uh, give it to somebody who already, um, or who does actually, who will do it. Um, a person who can have treatment that relieves their symptoms would still be eligible, as we've heard, that keeps, that, that counts for anorexia, could be arthritis, could be type 1 diabetes in the way that the bill is structured. Uh, there's no requirement to monitor the doctor's assessments. The doctor can assist the person to take the drugs, but not cause death. The doctor can be in the room, must stay with the patient, but does not need to be in the room. So we've got a lot of questions there. Use of a proxy to sign a form if the patient cannot is pretty open to abuse, I think. Um, it legalizes assisted suicide for death for patients whose death can be reasonably expected within six months. As we've heard, this is a guess. It's like the weather. You can tell what it's going to be now, like next week, but six months down the line, no. Um, even more disturbingly in some ways, Clause 23 prohibits the coroner's investigations into the death, which is just, you know, what is happening there? Why would they do that? Why would they include that in? That's just one of the many questions. The Secretary of State must ensure that uh, assisted suicide is available, but they are in no under no such duty to provide palliative care, which is surely what is needed. So last point, we now have evidence. When I started writing about this um, 25 years ago, we didn't have the evidence from abroad. Now we have evidence from abroad and um, regrettably my predictions have come true. So we have autistic men, at least nine autistic men, young men. And by the way, Sonia, the uh, the anorexic, 60 cases of anorexia are 100% women. That's uh, worth noting with that. But these are young men. Uh, one was in his 20s. He could not make social connections, could not make friends. So his doctor euthanized him. That's, you know, the, these are uncommon cases, but don't expect them to be, um, you know, I, I think any bad death is a bad death. Death. I agree with that sentiment from the other side, but any wrongful death like that uh, is, is just as wrongful as if we were talking about capital punishment. So um, these are not the most common scenarios, uh, but the most common scenario is, as I started off with, serial twos. It will be those people 
who fall through the cracks, who haven't got access, who are, who are waiting far too long for NHS services. Um, and it will be them that takes this option, if you like. It will be them that, that is left with fewer and fewer options and they will be uh, uh, moving, uh, they will be the ones that, that uh, not the sort of uh, poster lady for assisted dying, um, it will be those sort of tragic and, and unnecessary deaths that I think this bill will create. So as I say, the real face of assisted dying and who we need to keep in mind is Cyril Toos. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kevin, sorry. And actually, uh, very helpful to bring us back to the bill because that illustrates some of the concerns that people have got in the broader sort of moral sense as well, I think. And I think you illustrated that very well. OK, I've got three hands in the air. I just wanted to note that the chat is, I mean, goodness me, the chat's lively. Uh, there's a lot going on in the chat if people want to have a look. Um, I'm going to come out and get your comments. I have noted a certain... Uh, the, the the majority of people in the chat, just to warn um, James and Jonathan, um, are not on your side in this. Um, but I, I, this is not. A, I'm not using this as any kind of an opinion poll, by the way. I'm, I'm just making the point. But I do hope that we can get people to engage, as I said earlier, so that it's not. This is not a kind of only just one side of the argument. But let's start with Jean, please. Um, well, I, I just wanted to um, really ask a question with examples, because it seems to me I'm against the assisted dying uh, bill and in principle um, because of what it says about um, our attitude to human life. But it seems to me that connected to this is the whole issue of palliative care. I have a relative who was put on palliative care um, uh, without... Uh, the care manager called the doctor and the doctor over the phone decided that she should have palliative care and they persuaded her elderly husband that this would be a good idea. Um, but then I think another, um, so, I, so I'd be very suspicious about palliative care and the care manager told me, um, because we had a big argument about it, she, she told me that from the point of view of the care home, um, there's a lot of paperwork if somebody dies of natural causes. There has to be an autopsy. Uh, the police have to be called. Whereas if somebody dies through palliative care, then it's much more straightforward. Um, so I would say that that gives an incentive in some ways to the uh, care homes, particularly with people with dementia. But a more worrying thing, well, as worrying, I would like to know people's opinion of the emergency health care plans. Um, where again, I have an example of an elderly relative and I've since found out that this has applied to um, a lot of elderly people. When they're in hospital and very vulnerable, they're asked to, to um, sign emergency healthcare plans that basically their choice that if they are need to be host hospitalized again, they will agree to be treated at home. And the doctor says to them, um, they need to plan for um, uh, they need to plan for the end of their life, even though that person had no um, was very old, but it's not like he had lung cancer or something that you know is directly going to kill you. And they are excluding families because they say, well, you have power of attorney, but but this elderly person who's in hospital, and is uh, obviously afraid of the doctor, um, has capacity. And the only reason my cousin didn't sign it is because uh, he always says, I don't sign anything, you have to talk to Jean. Um, and that was the only basis on which they spoke to me. And in fact, he's home now, he's got care, he's got care coming in, and um, he's still old, uh, but he's not going to die in the short term. So I think that in terms of this debate, we need to look at the whole attitude to particularly elderly people and um, people with disabilities in terms of palliative care, emergency health care plans. And I'm always suspicious when people try to exclude um, the family on the basis that even though you have power of attorney, that person 
has what they has to have determined is capacity um, uh, at, at that moment of, of time, because that's that's a reflection of our attitude to human beings. The doctor said to me, we need to plan for death. And I said to her, well, our family plans for life. OK, um, Jean, can we leave it there, which is a very nice way to end it, as it happens, and some very useful points there. OK, um, very thought-provoking. Amanda, please. Yeah, I mean, I'm here as chair of Together Social Care, and also I'm the co-founder of Families Against Involuntary Medical Euthanasia. And I have to say that I agree with the concerns that many have raised and Jean has just raised around palliative care and how it can be abused. Um, I mean, families from you know, fame um, campaigns against uh, the, the abuse of end of life protocols within the NHS and the imposition of treatment ceilings on people who could survive, could uh, recover if treated. Um, but we believe that this is such an important decision. It will have such paradigm shifting impacts, not only on the NHS and what its, its, its purpose is, but also on the relationship between the doctor and the patient and the individual and the state. And for that reason, we are calling for a referendum on the issue. We agree with you, Claire, that this is far too much an important decision to be left to the fairly ill-informed, I have to say, political class to decide and but coming to the actual the bill itself um and you know some some of the, some of the speakers have raised the problems with the i mean kevin and uh sonia raised some of the problems with the the actual the so-called safeguards they are not strong i mean having two doctors we know from our experience that two doctors can often collude together and make a decision and the family is not involved. And they've said that the family has been involved and, and doctored notes, uh, medical notes. So that is a problem. And uh, we don't need to look at the slippery slope. Yeah, I'll try and be quick, Claire, but it's an important point. So we, yes, we can look at the slippery slope of other countries where this has been introduced. But I would argue, and we argue, that we need to look at the economic, political and cultural context here in the UK as to why this would be a terrible idea. We have NHS rationing, we have treatment ceilings, we have ageism and we have creeping utilitarian thinking within the NHS and with, uh, within society. And there's a very fine line between utilitarian bean counting and eugenics. And I think we need, really need to consider this very, very seriously. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Um, Amanda, would you put the details of your organisation in the chat? Because I yeah, think sure. people might well want to follow up with you on that, yeah. uh, on what you're doing more broadly. I'm going to just take Claude, then I'm going to come to the speakers. This were literally a kind of quick whiz across the panel. Then I'm going to try and get a couple more in before we say goodbye to Sonia, if you know what I mean. So, Claude, please. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, first of all, I have to correct James about Noel Conway. Uh, his wife is very clear and was quoted as saying that he had a painless and peaceful death with him in control. Uh, that was with the help of a specialist palliative care team and ventilation team. If he, wants the, if he wants the quote on that, happy to send it to him. But to come back to the bill, if Kim Ledbetter had instead said, look, we're going to save money, we're going to get rid of the parole board, and we're going to hand the decision to release prisoners to two police officers. They'll decide in secret by themselves. We won't monitor their assessment. Uh, they'll send some information to their chief super superintendent who will sign off the details. Everybody would be in uproar and be horrified. And yet that is the process very similar that's in Leadbeater's bill. Two doctors decide in isolation. There is no monitoring of their assessment process. There is no discussion about whether they're capable of detecting depression or coercion. Uh, the High Court judge, who, by the way, it's unlikely there'll be enough High Court judge to even cope with a small number. Uh, but the High Court judge is going to take the doctor's decisions as uh, a value judgment. The High Court judge is only going to look at legal compliance. They're not going to look at a clinical validity. So I think there's a fundamental flaw that is actually quite dangerous in the centre of Leadbeater's bill, uh, such that the decisions will hide errors, bias and discrimination. 
And when people say, well, there's no evidence of that abroad, I'm afraid there is. And if you look at Ontario and many other jurisdictions now, the evidence is beginning to appear bit by bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claude. Very useful. So if I can, James, pick up on one thing that you want to really kind of take up and then, I, I, and then I'll go across. James Essence, where are you there? Yeah. Uh, one thing. OK. Um, well, one or two, but you know what I mean. Quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's fine. Um, I mean, okay. With with the, I I, I don't disagree actually that a private members' bill might not be the the best vehicle for this. And personally, I, I'd rather see a referendum on it, given the nature and given what's at stake. Um, but but given the fact that all of the main political parties, I think, are unlikely to enact what I see as the will of the people in this regard, and 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 include this as kind of formal manifesto commitment. I think we are where we are with this, and I would rather see it go through, albeit through a private member's bill, than not at all. Um, I'm, 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 I kind of pick up on something generally that I've experienced when I have conversations with people on the other side, and even through some of the points that have been made tonight, which is I, I find that those on the other side seem to avoid talking about the individuals, the terminally ill individuals who are calling for this. They seem to avoid actually talking about the dying element Normally, when we're looking at introducing legislation, we think, well, what purpose are we introducing this? And then we come to look at what is the safest way to do that. But here, what I often hear are simply uh, slippery slope arguments, uh, hypothetical concerns around abuse, which should be taken seriously. But what I don't hear is a face to face engagement with the suffering terminally ill people who are calling for this legislation. And, and why is that? And I, I think, honestly, the truth of it is that it's a kind of form of self numbing. I think that if those on the other side of the argument really did sit down and tussle with the huge amount of suffering and indignity that people are going through, I think they would find it very difficult to stop themselves from supporting such a change in the law. So it's just something I've noticed around the kind of talking points on this issue. OK, thanks. Um, Sonia? Yeah, I really strongly disagree with that. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that's concerned me about this debate, actually, look, this is a really, really sensitive issue and there are really important points on both sides. And there is no question that assisted dying is very passionately wanted by some people, including those with terminal illness, and that there is some suffering it could alleviate. There is also no question that palliative care could support a lot more people to a better death. But just because we don't... It, it, so many things in society are a balancing act. They're about conflicting rights. They're about risks. And I definitely have listened to people who very passionately want this. I've watched documentaries. I've heard people talk about how passionately they want this. People who are very ill, people who are contemplating and then that they don't want to have. I have huge compassion for them. It's not that I'm not listening to them properly. And I think this is one of the issues that proponents of the bill have. They don't understand that you can look at this very delicate balance and legitimately come to different perspectives on it. So I completely accept that some people will look at the, the difficulties involved here and have a different position. But it, to me, it feels dishonest to say the people who are opposing this are just opposing it because they've numbed themselves to the suffering on one side. In fact, if, you know, I'd go as far as to say that's really patronising. A lot of us who oppose this have deeply thought about this. We understand the strength of the view on all sides. Um, and actually, you know, some one of the difficulties is, is that, you know, I, I know a lot of women who suffered domestic abuse and coercive control and who've been through the family courts. I know the kinds of people who wrongful deaths would happen to. And actually, sometimes it's very difficult to hear their voices, but there are important voices on both sides of the debate. Um, so I think that that's really important. And I actually think sometimes it's important to be able to take a step back from the emotion um, and very emotive language to be able to say, look, there are risks on both sides and what risks are we willing to tolerate and able to do this for some person, some people. But let's make sure that we're, you know, we're having a fact based argument about who this would alleviate suffering for but also how far palliative care could go and I don't think that some of what Jane said kind of acknowledges actually how far palliative care can go the only other point I wanted to make was I really agreed with whoever it was about the changing Amanda who talked about the relation changing relationship between the state and the citizen and doctor and patient and that is another one of my concerns about this I suppose which is 
as well as writing about safeguarding and coercive control, I've written a lot about institutional scandals of the state. I've written about things like mid staffs. I've written about the maternity scandals. I've written about the scandal of healthcare at the Tavistock. Um, you know, I've written about institutional child sex abuse. We are right, and I say this as um, somebody on the left who wants the state to do more, but we are right to distrust the state because the state at its worst gets things very, very wrong. And when you're talking about state sanctioned death, actually, you've got to be really, really careful before you cross that Rubicon. And that's where some of the concerns, I think, from skeptics on my side come from. OK, thank you. But what I'm going to do now is <laughs> Kevin and uh, Duncan, to panic. I'll give you longer time in a minute. But I'm going to take Jan George Reese, Sonia for our final words, and then I'm going to give um, some a little bit of extra time to Jonathan and Kevin. But um, Jan uh, Bowman, yeah. Thanks. Jan Bowman, by the way, um, is the sorry. Jan Bowman is the designer of the Letters on Liberty uh, produced with the Academy of Ideas and brilliant designs they are. So thank you, Jan. But anyway, moving on. Yes, moving on. Um. I think it's sometimes much easier to con ourselves that we're being humane and we don't want to see um, our, our beloved suffering. Hang on, my phone's going to die. Um, when actually we're, we're, when actually it's because they're too much trouble. And we, 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 we put our pets to sleep when, because we don't want to see them suffer. Um, but we don't do the same thing traditionally to our parents because we recognise that human life is inherently separate. And it seems to me that, can I just move this? I'm going to have to turn my vision off while I plug in. That, that sorry about this. Um, that we're, we're, dodging, we're dodging responsibility. And that palliative care, it seems to me, while we don't have decent palliative care for everybody, and I... I I know I heard last week that 80 to 90 percent of all palliative care is for cancer patients, and yet they only make up something like 30 percent of all deaths. There's obviously a terrible problem with, with palliative care in this country. And if we're already not have providing, providing good palliative care for people, it seems to me morally, moral, a, a real moral failure for people to be campaigning for um, assisted dying instead. I, it seems to me symptomatic of a, a moral crisis in the society that there's so much enthusiasm for, for, for assisted suicide rather than for palliative care. Just one final, there's more of a question. I'm a, I can't hear you, Claire. Dan, you've got to be quiet now. Sorry. George, only just because I've got to get people in. George, please. Hello there, everybody. Um, just, I guess I'm, I'm directing this at everybody, but mostly at James. Um, there are four broken systems, all of which will be, all of which will be impacted by this. We've got a broken NHS system, a broken social care system, uh, a lack of investment in, a lack of investment in palliative care, uh, uh, judges backlogging in, ju judges backlogging the courts that, 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 um, and, and also a lack of access to therapy and counselling. Now, now, what 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 we need to understand, and what I would suggest is that most people on this call read Sir Michael Marmot and 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 and, and get an awareness of of health inequalities, because sadly, the because sadly these broken systems affect the same amount of people, and 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 whilst life and death is difficult for everybody, you are. You are very, very lucky if you have never, if you have never experienced suffering until the point at which you are down to live, to die naturally. There, there, there are many people that that, that are that are living, living um, and suffering as a result of broken systems and state failure. Who who are who are not dying, but who would like to alleviate their pain, whether that be because of in anorexia because of lack of benefits and and as and, and as kevin would say it will be quicker under the provisions of this bill to die under assisted suicide than to get the the, the support that many people need to get because of because of lack okay. of social care lack of health care etc and 
and and and and and then this is not just about this is not just about people that that are dying it's about people that are living bad bad lives who we need to support thank you very much george very useful reese Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rhys Johnson, a lecturer at the University of Essex. Uh, I felt compelled to sort of chip in um, with regards to uh, James's comments. Um, and, and I think, you know, these sort of individual narratives of suffering are, are very compelling, you know, seen as urgent and worthy of action. Um, but it's interesting um, when you compare those narratives with the experiences of marginalized people, uh, people of color, um, when they experience pain and suffering, we've seen countless um, stories in the news um, when ethnic minorities are in pain and suffering um, and seeking treatment, they often don't get the treatment that they need. Um, so I think there's a really interesting distinction, uh, sorry, a really interesting message about this bill, which for me is somebody who writes about assisted dying and the cultural um, impacts of assisted dying on ethnic minorities is that as a society, we don't care enough about the pain and suffering of people of color, but if they want an assisted suicide, then we'll respond compassionately. And I think there needs to be more done to make sure that access to palliative care and a more equitable um, approach to the assessment and management of pain for ethnic minorities um, before we start thinking about um, introducing assisted suicide into healthcare. Um, Listen, some fascinating discussion here. Sonia, your your last thoughts, just to let people know, and I will be coming back to you all, so if you want to speak, put your hands up, um, that we put this film out um, with some of the films actually with all sides of the debate um, as our free sub stack um, great if you can give us some money but free as well um, in the next couple of days because we do want to share what have been some really really brilliant um, points that have been made so far but Sonia your final thoughts before you have to leave I'll be, I'll be very brief because I feel like I've already monopolised some of the conversation so far um, thanks for having me and actually I found the conversation in the chat really really fascinating so thank you to everyone who's contributed to that and i've noted down a couple of points from it because they're things that i want to go away and um, and think about i mean i guess the the the, my final words i would just want to be are in terms of um process i don't think we should be in this is has become a very divisive and divisive and polarized issue in the set terms of conversation that we've been having um I I think you need a better process because you just do not want a position to be in a position where this is legalised and people feel scared. They feel scared of going into hospital when they're older. They feel scared of being in a care home because they're worried that this will be imposed on them when they don't want it. And um, that's something that's really worrying to me. I think we have to take everyone in society with us or as much as we can. And this process just is not helpful to that um, because of the amount of concerns that there are about this bill and I think we need to have a conversation about whether it's possible whether it's even possible to do something that would alleviate some of these very serious concerns so I think that that would be my last word thank you very much for having me though Claire thanks Sonia uh, good luck with it and carry on reading Sonia everyone and um, <laughs> uh, uh, and see you on the tally later as they say when I turn it on okay bye-bye. take care Sonia. bye-bye right so um Jonathan Um, you're not unmuted, Jonathan. I don't know if that's us or you. Yeah. Yes, there you go. Uh, yeah, just to address some of those points, we we heard the phrase state-sanctioned death. Actually, no, this will be self-sanctioned death. It will be initiated and carried out with no other assistance apart from getting a prescription by the person concerned. So let's just be very clear about terms. Um, we heard about lack of monitoring. Well, actually, no, uh, there is total lack of monitoring of people uh, today. Uh, who go off and do their own thing or go abroad. Um, uh, This bill would actually bring everything into the open, transparent, monitored, regulated, and, by the way, a five-year sunset clause. In other words, it would be reviewed in five years. So if it's not working, although every other country found it has been, uh, we could have a chance to adjust it. Um, talk, people have said, quite rightly actually, why aren't we talking more about palliative care, health care, uh, emergency care, uh, care for ethnic minorities? That's all great. Um, and, and in a sense, this debate, this bill has provoked that debate and made it much more forefront. But that's not an either or. We can, we can um, talk about all of those things and push and campaign for them, but that shouldn't stop us offering an assisted death to those who actually are suffering right now. And again, we're not talking theory. We are talking about 
And I think the stats are 17 people a day who die in pain. By the way, that's 34 tomorrow, uh, and that's 68 in a couple in, in four days' time. You know, we're, there are people in agony right now. This is not theory, and we ought to help those people suffering right now. Um, and it's precisely because of our attitude to life is precious that we don't want people to die in pain. And by the way, against their will. So in whose interest are we forcing people to live on against their will? Uh, and two final points. Um, people have referred to what's going on in Ontario or elsewhere. Uh, yeah, uh, they do things differently. But this is Britain. I mean, just because in, in Europe they drive on the right-hand side of the road doesn't mean to say we do. Well, this is a British parliament, British MPs, and we will fashion a law that people in this um, uh, forum or MPs in parliament uh, think is right and proper. And the reason I've carried, uh, uh, I've mentioned Oregon quite frequently is precisely because that's the only place where, actually there's Victorian Australia as well, uh, where they have exactly this law. So we can choose which laws to um, which, which type of laws to enact, because this will be assisted dying British version. And finally, the six month thing. Well, remember, it doesn't mean to say that you automatically um, have an assisted death at six months. It just that's the minimum time uh, past which you, ca uh, you can actually apply. But most people will carry on until they can to the very possible end, because there is nothing stronger than the life force. Uh, and what's interesting about Oregon, and I'll uh, end with this, is a lot of people have palliative care first, and then uh, after a while, when they find that even palliative care can't help, uh, then they go for an assisted death. Conversely, there's, I think it's a third of people who apply for an assisted death don't actually take it. What they do is they have it as a, almost an emotional safety net. So they know that if things get really pear-shaped, uh, then they have got that prescription uh, in the cupboard. Uh, but actually, a third do not take it because that life force impels us to carry on for as long as we possibly can. And people will only take it when they really can't bear life any longer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, so, Kevin, your, your thoughts, and then I'm going to come back out at least for one more round of questions. So do, you know, I can see that Claude wants to speak again, which is great because he said interesting things the first time. But um, anyone who hasn't spoken, do stick your hands up. Otherwise you're going to miss your moment. Um, okay, Kevin. Right, quite a few things. First of all, thanks to Jonathan and James because you're bad, you're basic quite a bit of stick here. Uh, and I, I admire the fact that you, you are coming in and, and uh, you know, batting for your side, so to speak. Uh, quite a few things are being pitched at you. Having said that, I echo Sonia's irritation at the idea that that you know um, we have we spoken to suffering dying people. You don't get to be my age and not suffer, to speak to suffering dying people. My father died in 2021. Uh, before he died, when he was told he had um, lung cancer, he decided that he was going to shoot himself and uh, regale us all with a tale of how he was going to do so and keep it, you know, how he was going to have a tarp out. He was very practical, um, a tarp out in front and everything else like that. He didn't actually do that. Um, people who are given terminal prognoses are understandably very depressed and suicidal. Um, and I think, you know, we, we need to know, first of all, it's irritating to, because I've got just as much experience as, as just about anybody else of, of attending dying people, sitting beside dying people, and bad deaths, I've, you know, one or two. So, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm just saying that. First of the next point, polling. It really depends which poll you look at. So there's a poll out today in the Daily Telegraph that has support for legalizing assisted suicide, assisted dying, at 11%. And, you know, this is after somebody has had, this is an extensive poll that asked people many questions and alerted them to various different things. If you ask a, a dignity and dying poll, it's 75%. If you ask that poll, it's 11%. Uh, I don't think polling is the best moral um, authority, really, on which to, to uh, pass this law. Um, in terms of, you know, one question, First of all, I couldn't help to do this, uh, Jonathan. Um, you said that this didn't bring, that this wasn't an issue uh, in the Old Testament. Now, I suddenly thought Masada, um, there was a, a little uh, event there that I recall 
that involved suicide. So I, I just couldn't help but push that through, point that out to you. I'm sure you know uh, about it. Not in the Old Testament, Lev. Not in the Old Testament. Wasn't it? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's the problem when you get an atheist to uh, do this kind of thing. I know about the Masada. I thought it was I don't want Testament. this becoming a Bible study group under okay. any circumstances. Right. Anyway, carry on. Okay. I really do, but we'll stop. Um, uh, next thing is, I mean, I just couldn't help but pick up James. Are dying people suicidal or are they not suicidal? You st started out by saying this is about suicide, it's legal. And then you said they're not suicidal. Uh, is, there's a contradiction there um, in what you're saying. Um, if dying people aren't suicidal, then they shouldn't kill themselves, which is what will be legalized under this bill. Um, finally, I'd just say to those people who think that, you know, this is a good idea, think about the Liverpool pathway, care pathway, think about the post office scandal, think about Grenfell, think about the horrific things that happened with COVID, and tell me that this is a really good idea to get the state to decide whether people live and die. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. So I'll come back to you. So. I'm going to go to Claude. I've actually got a few questions. I I want to just check or encourage. I mean, it's not obligatory, but I want to encourage people to uh, to speak. Um, but we're not going to carry on a meeting that nobody wants to speak at. So this is your last chance um, to put your hands up and say something, Claude. I I just wanted to finish up with some conciliatory thoughts. They're not my thoughts. Uh, there's some thoughts by Catherine Mannix who's written two excellent books. One is With the End in Mind and the other one is called Listen. Um, and she's described the current debate uh, as a doubles tennis match. And what she says is that two players are hurling balls at each other, regardless of where they hit or hurt. But the other two players are now close to the net and have started to talk to each other. And it's that talking that we need to start doing. At the moment, we've been hearing some very strong views on both sides, but at some point, uh, then we may need to find some common ground. And I think there is common ground. I think there is shared concern about the safety of patients, the legitimacy for families and patients, the safety for health care. I think there is common ground. So maybe we need to get closer to the net. Those who are going to continue hurling balls will continue doing it. That's what campaigns do on both sides. Um, but it's time to be talking close to the net. That's all I was going to say. Oh, thank you. That, that was rather moving, Claude. Thank you very much indeed. And um, Paul. Oh, Paul. Sorry, yourself, sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry uh, Uber Eats actually rung up just as I was about to speak, so never mind. Um, what, what, what I wanted to speak about was um, I'm fairly, I'm fairly like my my view on this is fairly like Sonia's insofar as um, you know if 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 uh, the mechanisms or whatever for dying were you know science medical science went ahead and is proved completely painless, whatever I guess. But I suppose my main point is that as far as the bill's concerned, there's been quite a lot of um, uh, explanation about how it would work in terms of um, how, how it could be monitored and how people will be checked, whether it's sort of mental capacity, things like this. And I suppose for me, for the bill to work, and I don't really support it anyway, but if it was going to work, the checks that would have to go on with the individual involved in their family would almost be so invasive that there would be there would be a certain loss of dignity in that process. I'm not necessarily making this clear, but the, if 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 there are going to be proper checks on this bill, and I don't think it's possible, um, they would be quite tortuous, I guess. So it's not just a question of um, it's just sim you know just simply done. I you know there's just so many checks that would need to be done for this for this bill to actually work and i just think uh maybe the other side as it were um maybe not might need to consider that that's pretty much all i've got to say sorry it's me not unmuting myself now thanks paul that that was actually very interesting um so i think amanda do you want to speak now or 
or have I lost you? But anyway, while Amanda's sorting herself out, I've got a couple of questions for both sides and then I'll take Amanda. So let me just ask my questions. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, both James and Jonathan, one of the things that I think is confusing about the notion of suffering is that we've got to a point where the suffering described is is often only physical, whereas actually a lot of the time that you hear about suffering in people's lives, it is actually genuinely psychological suffering. You know, it's not the physical pain that people really are wretched, you know, and, and if you talk to people who have got severe mental illness, you know, who can be psychotic, who, you know, manic depression, and you're in the depths of despondence, so on and so forth. The reason I, I, so I'm saying that is because I can't see why you'd almost privilege the terminally ill pain sufferers over somebody else, in which case, isn't that therefore a slippery slope in a way? Because I don't know, how do you make the decision about what's worse? I mean, I, I've known people who've gone through incredible pain physically, but other people who are perfectly healthy physically, but are in a much more wretched state because of their mental you know, because maybe, you know, like, I know it sounds terrible, but I know a couple who, who you know, whose young son was murdered, right? And and they had a kind of living hell, and they always said they wanted to die. There was nothing worth living for. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? There's that. Um, but we've already seen people with motor neurone disease who've said, why are you confining it to the six months terminally ill people? When we have got the kind of, I mean, motor neuron disease it is physically ravaging, why can't we be involved? So is there a danger that, of course, you'll have a kind of, I don't want to say silly, but competitive suffering going on and people saying, well, what about my suffering? What about my suffering? Because that, I don't think the slippery slope is, I'm personally not convinced by this kind of, the state of malevolent, they're all going to go around killing us. I'm more think that people genuinely will say my suffering should count too and that's where you get into a very difficult situation but I also want to ask Kevin when when he comes back um what about what about a kind of more libertarian argument you know I believe I all the time talk about autonomy people being free to make their decisions and I understand about the dependence on doctors and that the state might be involved and therefore in a way you are dependent but are you undermining the sense of autonomy of people to make choices about how they how they end their lives? I feel as though sometimes there's a kind of um, infantilizing aspect to the way that people who are opposed to assisted dying uh, behave. I also think, by the way, that there can be, and I've noticed it a lot in relation to this bill, the danger of a kind of scaremongering from people who are opposed to assisted dying. You know, it's kind of like, it really is like everybody's going to become, all doctors are going to be like Harold Shipman. The state are going to be knocking people off. Families are misanthropically, you know, waiting for granny so they can get them older than money. Uh, nobody can afford to pay for um, uh, uh, people to go into care homes. So, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, right, and I, 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 when I hear those arguments, I feel as though they're a bit cheap, and they've certainly got a very negative view of human motivation. They're really quite unpleasant version of what we as citizens are. I think ninety nine percent of the population want the best for their loved ones and their family. They're not doing this so they can get the inheritance or save money in the cost of living crisis. Surely that's too much. Anyway. Right, Amanda's got a point. Then if nobody else wants to uh, come in after Amanda, I'm going to take my final three speakers to uh, give us their final thoughts. Amanda. Yeah, I mean, what I, I, in reply to you just now, Claire, yeah, I, you know, I agree that I don't think um, we have to fear our families. I think we have far more to fear from the state uh, than we do our own families and friends. Uh, however, I think, you know, there are families like that, you know, we have to acknowledge that, but no, it's not a huge problem. Um, but the thing is, um, the, the coercion.
does not actually have to be. And, and I agree with Kevin that now that the in the bill, the possibility of a doctor suggesting this to a patient is very dangerous, knowing what I know about the protocol abuses. Knowing this, I think this is really dangerous. Then we have in the, the, the judges. The judges, uh, the judge does not actually have to speak to the requester of a sister, you know, who, who wants to be aided in their death. Doesn't have to speak to them, can if he wants to. Um, the judge then has to hear from the doctor, but he does not have to interrogate the doctor. He doesn't have to ask the doctor any questions. And who is this doctor? Is it, uh, it's not even a doctor, it's a medical practitioner. Is that a physician associate? Is that a nurse? I mean, what kind of level of expertise does this person have to make this, this um, suggestion and to, you know, even on the back of a possibly dodgy end of life protocol, uh, end of life prognosis. And the, you know, th th these are really meaty issues that we have to um, get to grips with. But I would actually finish and say, do we want an NHS that segues from an institution that protects and sustains life to one that plays an active role in ending it? And you can say it's not playing an active role because the person makes a decision and they administer it, but that has been facilitated by the NHS. And do we want to become a nation that views the elderly and the frail and those who are terminal um, which, and they might have many, um, much longer to live. In my own case, my mother was given three end of life prognoses, prognoses, and she defied every single one of them by three and a half years. My brother was given a one year prognosis five years ago with lung cancer. He's still here living well. You know, we have to take this quite seriously. And, you know, do we want to sort of have a society that has less value on somebody because of their age and their diminished health? Or do we want to have to aspire to being a society that affords equal respect to human life, that values the cont contribution of its citizens and ensures equal access to our collective resources, irrespective of age of infirmity? And I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, again, very interesting contribution from you. I, I, Hillary, who, who has got a point. Yeah, I put my hand up before Amanda had finished there. So she said some of the things I was going to say. So I won't repeat those. But, but just to say that I do think the real problem here is that we need to be really clear about what, it, what a good life means. And I think the problem is that we're getting so tangled up with what a good death means that we've forgotten what a good life is. And I know that doesn't necessarily help with this debate about the assisted suicide bill, but I do think that a wider societal project must be to, to reinvent and reinvigorate the idea of what we mean by a good life. Okay, thank you. Very, very short and poignant and philosophical and deep. Um, but Alistair, I'm just going to ask you, do you want to speak? Where's he gone? No, are you all right? Okay, fine. Okay, so I'm going to start the reverse order then, which is I'm going to um, take Jonathan for your final remarks, then Kevin, um, then James, and then I've just got an announcement at the end. But anyway, um, so, Jonathan. Okay, well, firstly, I rather like Claude's um, analogy of the tennis match, so thank you very much for that. Although I was intrigued that everybody so far has been against I think that's true. Whereas, uh, depending on what poll you have, you know, 75% in favour or 11%, we haven't even had 11% in favour. So I don't know what coercion of negativity is going on. But uh, there we go. Just to remind people, I changed my mind. In other words, I was swayed not by ideology, but by practical experience of just seeing many people dying in pain. And I don't think we've, we've addressed some of the potential problems, but we haven't addressed the real suffering at present. Not theoretical, but real. Um, also, just to remind, um, people just seem to completely dismiss Oregon, who've been doing it for 27 years. The fact that they've done it for 27 years, and by the way, they work now hand in hand with palliative care organisations, who, to be fair, opposed assisted dying when it came in. But once it did come in, they saw the benefits and they now work hand in hand uh, with assisted dying. Why aren't we paying attention to something that's gone on for more than a quarter of a century? Uh, it just seems that that would answer a lot of the fears. Uh, polling, yes. Um, Kevin, you're right. You can't 
uh, go by polling. Um, uh, so even if you dispute my 66% of people of faith, all I can tell you is I get invited to a lot of churches and synagogues to speak. I always feel I'm going to get barracked. Honestly, it's an open door. I, you know, I can tell you just that the population at large, the religious population, is absolutely in favour just from my own going to 20 or 30 synagogues or, or, or churches. I've been surprised. Um, uh, autonomy. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Claire, because it hasn't really come up a lot. At the moment, actually, we don't. Uh, because we've at the present we've got state imposition of enforced suffering. The state enforces you to keep on suffering and won't let you have any options. Uh, assisted dying would mean that you can suffer on if you want, fair enough, or you can have the option not to. Um, you know, we all want to, con and, and again, Oregon, most of the people there are who, who, who opt for it are in the AB or sometimes ABC bracket. So there is strict monitoring, by the way. Um, that means people who may, used to be making their own decisions about life want to make their own decision about death. I mean, we all choose, by and large, you know, who we marry, where we live, what job we have, why should, what holidays we go on, what clothes we wear, what food we eat. Why should the only thing we don't choose be the manner of our dying? Um, and let me um, end with an experience I had that is a, a little bit like today, uh, but not quite. Um, I went to a group, I won't name it, um, who are uh, implicitly opposed on principle to assisted dying. Why they invited me there for, I don't know, except they had a wonderful time uh, haranguing me, embarrassing me, and sent, gave me lots and lots of tough questions, much, much tougher. Um, and at the end of it, I said, look, okay, look, fine, you've got your view, I'm not going to change it quite clearly, but just let me ask you one thing. Um, and there were about 100 people in the room. I said, if you yourself was dying in pain, would you want the option of an assisted death? And I have to tell you, 100 hands shot up. And I said, right, OK, so if you want it for yourself, maybe, why are you denying that to other people? Um, thanks, Jonathan. I hope you have only been too barracked tonight, but I actually agree with you. I'm a bit surprised that there wasn't, you know, more people. We haven't had lots of hands going up. Um, so I don't know whether it's that people feel um, it's quite personal and they're not speaking, but I'm surprised because it certainly doesn't reflect, as you rightly pointed out, that outside of, um, you know, in 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 the real world, this is a much more polarizing. Not, I don't necessarily mean hostilely polarizing, but people have got very strong views on either side, and we have only really heard, in terms of the audience, on one side. But I do think it's been helpful to not have the barricade because I do think people have been doing that thing of listening. So I think that's that's an important point. So I don't know that you, I don't know that you won't have had an impact on people. People are kind of mulling this over. Um, I found this public, not this tonight, I mean, this period in the last few weeks, people are really thinking about this quite hard. And long may that carry on, because these matters of life and death and who we are and what life's about and so on, I want society to reflect on with that degree of seriousness and depth. So um, uh, uh, so thank you for your contribution. Anyway, Kevin, um, do you want what's your final thoughts you want to share, please? Well, uh, just to answer your questions, Claire, um, first of all, yes, I think it, the, what we probably all agree on is that it's very good that we're having this discussion. And in fact, I'm grateful for the bill in some ways because it brings it up and it's making everybody thoughtful about this issue. And I think that is a very good thing. And I think this audience also shows that uh, people are very ambivalent about this issue. And in fact, in the polling that I've been involved in, that's what it showed. It showed there's a strong section of us on one side, strong section on the other, and a great gray area of people who are just not making up their minds entirely or going back and forth. And I think this has been a very, very good thing. So uh, well done to, to for this meeting, but also I think the bill has been a good thing. Now, in terms of your question, Claire, um, yes, I tend to be libertarian as well and support the whole idea of autonomy. But I would argue that this doesn't have very much to do with autonomy at all. And the reason you can take it, it, autonomy, it tends to be its selling point, but it's not real. And how you can tell that is that there's a little machine called a Sarco, which is the ultimate in autonomy. Basically, it's a miniature gas chamber 
uh, brought over by Philip Nitschke. You might have read about it in the papers whereby he has been, uh, or the person, somebody else has been actually charged with uh, participating in the death of a, another person. If we were very into autonomy, we didn't want to have doctors involved, then we'd all get the sarco. And I, I always ask people who are opposed or are in favor of assisted suicide, why don't we get the sarco? If you're so interested in autonomy, they, they, the sarco is the best solution. But I find it horrific. I find it horrific that you can get rid of a life, a human life, in such a sort of awful and, and trite and and um, oh, I, I I don't like it. But uh, if somebody else does, I'd prefer that sort of a solution rather than enlisting the NHS to get involved in this entire process. So um, I don't think it really is about autonomy. I think it is about compassion. I think there are compassion on both sides of the debate. But I think also lurking below compassion is utility. There is a sense that, in fact, there are it's the least productive members of society who we're thinking about when we are doing this. And it, it lurks behind in some of the discussion um, so, for instance, Matthew Paris's column, people might have seen that, where he said, in fact, that it, this should actually be a duty to die for those people who are taking up much too many, many too, much too much resources in the National Health Service and elsewhere. Uh, this also came up with a Belgian head of the largest Belgian um, health uh, insurance company, and he made the point he thinks all elderly people should really be um, up for this because they are no longer productive and they are taking up beds and taking up huge amounts of the care budget. And this is also in the Netherlands where they've had a petition with, uh, I think, 150,000 signatures saying that everybody should be over the age of 75 should be um, up for this. So there is a utility aspect that I think uh, is involved in that. Your second question, Claire, is about scaremongering. Um, first, I would argue that, in fact, um, the argument for assisted suicide is based on scaremongering, specifically scaremongering about a bad death. The vast majority of deaths are peaceful and good. And, uh, you know, I think the idea that we're going to choke on our feces, as somebody said in the chat, who worked in palliative care, she has seen one death in her many, many years, and that's thousands of deaths that she's seen, that that has occurred. And I think scaremongering is what you do when you say, um, oh, you will have a bad death if you don't, um, if we don't legalize this and, and have this sort of suicide pill around our neck. Um, most people will die peacefully. Even in the Netherlands, where uh, it's been legal for 20 years, there's between 28.5 and 42.3, correct me if I'm wrong, Claude, because I know you, you know these uh, statistics, of deaths are actually either painful or restless. And this is in an area where it's entirely legal. So it's not going to address the problems that it pretends that it's going to address. Um, and I think... Okay. Final thought. Okay. Well, I would just say that I, I very much agree with Hillary. Um, I think what this is really about is a bad life rather than a bad death. It's the final parts of life that people fear. And there's no reason to fear them. Um, and I think um, just to say we need to vote this, we need to get rid of this bill, we need to vote it down and then have a proper conversation in that order. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that's been interesting, uh, just before I take James, that I, I wish that we'd had a discussion that allowed us not to get trapped into whether this bill works or not in terms of society. If we're going to have this discussion, I think enough people want, want to think about it, then, then we could have really raised some of the things that have come up tonight very well. Um, where's where James? There you are. Sorry, I was just looking for you. James, your final thoughts, please. Yes, and I, I echo what you just said, actually, Claire. Uh, I wish there had been more of a public conversation, not just solely prompted by this this bill. I think we've become very fixated on it. As I say, I'm not even convinced myself it's necessarily the best vehicle to push this forward through. Um, just a few final points. Somebody mentioned about animals and how we treat 
pets. And I think that's very interesting because I've listened to terminally ill people wanting a change in law and they say we wouldn't treat a, you know, a dog, a pet dog or a pet cat like this. And I find that interesting because when it comes to pets and we know that we do put down pets um, out of a sense of compassion and to alleviate suffering, those animals are not consenting to that decision being made uh, for them. But here we have the status quo, which is that there are adult human beings in this country with the capacity to consent to end their lives. And we're essentially denying them that right, which I find to be quite odd. Um, on palliative care, because that's come up a few times, the Health and Social Care Committee uh, report that's been referenced earlier, they actually said, quote, in the evidence we received, we did not see any indications of palliative and end of life care deteriorating in quality or provision following the introduction of assisted dying in other countries. And they said, indeed, the introduction of assisted dying has been linked with an improvement in palliative care in several jurisdictions. So, again, uh, these things are not mutually exclusive. Um, coercion has come up a number of times tonight. At the moment, we essentially have the worst of both worlds, because as I've said earlier, suicide is already lawful in this country. People can already be coerced into killing themselves. But on the top of that, we are essentially forcing terminally ill people to stay alive against their wishes or to die without dignity. Um, and actually, logical consistency would state that those against this legislation should also be in favour of recriminalising suicide. Um, we, we have state-sanctioned suicide just without the dignity. Um, finally, just, uh, just to share something of myself in, in all of this, because um, you might find it odd that I'm on this side of the argument if I tell you that from a young age I've suffered from extreme death uh, anxiety uh, that's been the subject of many years of therapy. Uh, unsuccessful therapy, I should add. Um, the, the thought of death absolutely terrifies me. Uh, I've always said that if there was a cure for mortality, I would be the first guinea pig in the line to sign up to it. But I've been on a bit of a journey. Uh, there was a time in which I could not comprehend or condone somebody wanting to extinguish their life, no matter how much they were suffering. But I made a point of listening to some of these people locked into lives that they no longer wish to live, suffering in agony every day. And I realised that their ability to have the right kind of death was much more important than my discomfort at the idea of it. And, and that's how I've gotten to where I am today. Thank you. Thank you very much. God, thanks for sharing that, James. I mean, apart from the fact that he knew. So there we go. Um, but anyway, just to conclude, can I just thank everyone for listening? I've noticed in the chat people saying, look, I didn't speak, but that's because I'm thinking, I'm listening. I'm taking it all in. I think that's really rewarding as it goes. And the other thing I wanted to say, and it just relates to what James has said, but which everyone has shared, Jonathan has made this point as well, um, as well as Sonia earlier. Um, and Kevin has made the point, it's maybe ended up arguing something that wouldn't be something you'd think of, but you're more libertarian to argue, is I think it's really important that people are saying they've changed their minds. I mean, it does make you think we need to go out to talk to every young person we've ever met in our lives and say, I know you believe that you think that everything you now think at 18 is correct, right, and you will never, ever change your mind. And you're locking yourself away in a safe space and say, I don't want to hear anything. This is the only view of the world. It's actually really refreshing to hear adults maturely admitting that they had a different position, they listened, they talked to people, and they ended up in a different place, even if they ended up on opposite sides, ironically. Um, you know, so, so what? That's what democracy is all about. It's what politics is all about. And as it happens, it's what the Academy of Ideas is dedicated to doing, which is enriching civil society in order that people can hear each other, listen, and then as autonomous individuals, think what do i think for myself rather than just going along with the post the fashionable or 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 or, or, or the orthodoxy and um, so i'd really like to thank everyone who has participated i hope that we'll um you keep in touch if you don't know the academy of ideas sign up as has already been said to our our sub stack just because it's our kind of one-stop shop where we let you know what's going on um uh, uh, as a newsletter um and i really appreciate how maturely um, and seriously everyone has taken this discussion it's given me plenty more to think about and if it comes back if if this bill does go through and it ends up in the house of worlds i can assure you i'll be citing a number of things that people 
have said tonight because I think it's been a very uh, rich conversation. So thank you very much indeed. If we can all just unmute or if anyone, somebody can unmute or whatever it is that you have to because you can I've never been inside of a Zoom meeting. Can the technical person unmute everyone or can everyone unmute? The reason we're doing this is so that we can oh. kind of... <laughs> Clap, clap our speakers and say hello to each other. And uh, generally, thank you very much.